Please join me in the call to worship. O Lord, O God, how majestic is your name and all the earth. When I look at your heavens, the works of your fingers, what are mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. O Lord, O God, how majestic is your name and all the earth. Let us worship God. Please join me for the opening prayer. We do indeed stand in awe of you, O God. We rejoice that you have chosen us to be your own. By your word, the heavens were made. Your loving kindness fills the whole earth. By the bounty of your mercy, we have been born to new life. Hear now what fanfare we give as we lift our voices to, pre to praise your name. Amen. Our God, peace like a river. Our God, peace like a river. Our God, peace like a river in my soul. Our God, peace like a river. Our God, peace like a river. Our God, peace like a river in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean in my soul, yes I do. I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean in my soul. I got peace like a river. I got peace like a river. I got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river. I got peace like a river. I got peace like a river in my soul. The scripture for today is Acts chapter two, verses one through thirteen. When the day of Pentecost had come, there were they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tons as a fire appeared among them, and a ton rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at this sound the crowd gathered and were was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all those who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthian, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Fer Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and pros proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. Good morning, kids. Today is gonna to be the first of a three-part session on how Christians are like M&M's. I have here a bowl of some of the M&M's and let's look and see what's on them. There are M's on them. M&M's are marked with the letter M. Christians are like an M&M. We are marked with the Holy Spirit of God. In Ephesians 4, chapter, verses 30, it says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. But we are also marked for a purpose. We are marked for ministry. In Romans 8, verse 28, it says, 
And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And normally at this time I would be handing you out a little packet of M&Ms for you to help, to help you remember you are marked for ministry. So the next time you get some M&Ms, look for the printed M on the M&Ms and remember that you are marked with a purpose by the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Dear Lord, please be with the children this week. Help them to remember that they are marked for your purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week was Pentecost Sunday, and I agreed to forego a preaching of Pentecost message to set aside uh, last week to honor a Ruth Finley for her many years of faithful service. I did purpose, however, that I would not forego preaching a Pentecost message because this message is important to the life of the church. Many Christians are not experienced Pentecost in its full power, purpose, and benefits for a number of reasons. But perhaps the greatest of this, these reasons because they are unaware of how rich and powerful it would be, how rich and powerful it would make their lives. What is Pentecost? The word Pentecost designates the 50th day after Pentecost. It was on this day in the book of Acts that the Holy Spirit was poured out on 120 followers of Christ who were gathered in the upper room in Jerusalem. It was on this day that the church was born in a blaze of glory. The book of Acts records two great Pentecostal experiences in the early church. The first is we are familiar with in the book of Acts, which we've read today. But there was another experience later in the book of Acts, the 10th chapter, where the Holy Spirit was poured, of, poured out upon Gentiles while they were in the house of Cornelius. And throughout church history, many personal Pentecosts have occurred. Some time ago, I came across and read uh, the statement penned by Dr. Jerry Vines, who is a, a former president of a Southern Baptist Conference. I've never forgotten these words. He said, the average Christian and the average church are somewhere bogged down between Calvary and Pentecost. They have been to Calvary for pardon, but they have not been to Pentecost for power. The word Bethlehem means God with us. Calvary means God for us, but Pentecost means God in us. 
Many Christians do not understand the role of the Holy Spirit, and they have not appropriated the power of the Holy Spirit in their own personal lives. J.P. Phillips, who gave us a very familiar uh, paraphrase of the New Testament, wrote, what we need today is again the wind and the flame of Pentecost. One preacher said, Pentecost is not a denomination, but it is an experience that every blood-bought child of God should receive. John Wesley's transformation, in which many call his conversion experience, took place at a gathering on Aldergate Street. Here he experienced a life-changing experience. It is in this experience that he was converted. And he describes it in these words, my heart felt strangely warm. From this life-changing experience, he guided his followers into a particular understanding of the Holy Spirit that had always characterized the people called Methodists when they're at their best. Other important leaders in the emphasis of the Holy Spirit were Francis Asbury, Jacob Albright, Philip William Audubon, and many others who have shared deeply with Wesley in his emphasis on the work of the Holy Spirit. In designing City Road Chapel in London, John Wesley repeatedly used the symbol of an encircled dove around the front of the entire gallery. This apostolic affirmation of life-changing, continually active of the Holy Spirit was a primary characteristic of the Wesleyan movement, sermon, prayer, hymn, class meeting, and Christian living were premeditated with the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. On the basis of scripture, John Wesley taught that the Holy Spirit is present and active in every major stage of the Christian experience. We are privileged to live in a generation when God is designed to pour out his spirit in a mighty way. Joel says in the last days that God will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young, young men and your old men will see vision and dream dreams. We are living in the last days in which God desires to pour out his spirit. We must open to receive God's spirit promise of Pentecost in Peter's sermon on Acts, in Acts the second chapter, verses 38 through 39, Peter replied, repent and be ye baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, all whom the Lord our God will call. In effect, he's saying that this outpouring of the Holy Spirit is not for a special a special blessing, for a special few, for a special age. The promise of the Holy Spirit is for all people who receive the call to repentance and respond to that call. Since God is still calling people to, unto salvation, then the promise of the Holy Spirit is still good for now. All saved. People are converted because the Holy Spirit is that which comes to convert, to convince, and to inhabit the heart and life of the believer. What was the promise of Pentecost? It was the pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon all flesh, both men and women, boys and girls. Acts 24, 49 says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry or wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued or endowed with power from on high. Ten days ago, ten days after Jesus ascended unto the Father, he sent the blessed promise of the Father unto the faithful ones who obeyed and waited in the upper room. They were gathered together in one place and all on one accord, and they were praying and praising God. And the Holy Spirit came as a rushing mighty wind filling the house. Tongues of fire stood on each of them, and they were preaching in various languages. Peter's sermon that followed said, This is that 
This is that in which the prophet Joel had promised. This is that. It is the fulfillment of the promise that Jesus said, when I go away, I'll send another. I'll send you a comforter. I'll send someone that will be with you and someone that will be in you. And what's the purpose of Pentecost? God has not given us the Holy Spirit to enjoy alone while the world around us rushes on to hell. In Acts 1 and 8, it says, You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses unto me. We dare not forget the deeds of the needs of lost people, the people God loves, the people Christ died for, the people Christ commanded us to evangelize, go into all the world. And make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. When are we going to wake up? Forget our silly religious games and, and mean business for God. Souls are hanging in the balance. Some will fall and topple into hell unless we allow the power of the Holy Spirit to rescue them. Acts 1 and 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We must have the power of the Holy Spirit today. The word power in this text means to be equipped, to enable, to give ability. So he, he's not just talking about a little power. He's talking about dunamis, dynamite, power that helps us to convict and to convince others of their need of Christ. The modern church, as we see it for the most part, has lost the power of God. Most denominations are nothing more than social clubs, civic organizations with a religious tent. And just like Samson in the Bible, they don't know that the Spirit of God has left them. They still have a form of religion, but they have no power. They have laid their head in the lap, lap of Deliah, just as Samson laid his head in the lap of Deliah, and he lost his power with God and couldn't do nothing but to live a, de a defeated life. He was blind. He was bound. He was grinding in circles at the mill of his enemies. Christians today have been robbed of the power of God and leave them grinding on the millstone in weakness and defeat. They are blinded by the devil. And worst thing is they don't even know it. It's a new day. It's a new day for restoration. It's a new day and that God desires to restore the power of the Spirit to the church. In his last days, he said, I'll pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Consider three major powers of Pentecost. Not limited to, to these three because there's countless purposes and powers um, that we can benefit from by having an understanding of the Holy Spirit and allowing that Holy Spirit to to guide us, to lead us, to equip us. One uh, major power or benefit of the Holy Spirit is worshiping power. The Holy Spirit will help you to worship God in spirit and in truth. The, the chief aim of man is to worship God. But the devil has deceived people concerning worship. We go to church and sit on a cold pew and stare in the back of someone else's head, barely a whisper as as you sing a hymn, then listen to a 15-minute sermon about some religious themes that means nothing to you. You have to fight to stay awake and still you call it worship. You are a spectator and observer when God intended for you to be a participant. Real worship demands participation. The Holy Spirit will help you to worship God in spirit. He'll help you to lift up your soul to God and touch his heart with your heart. Anytime you put your put your finger to power, if you put your finger in an electric so so socket, you're, there's going to be a response, a reaction, a move. And when you when your heart touches the the center point of God's power and the Holy Spirit, there's going to be a response. Secondly, the Holy Spirit gives us warning power. The Holy Spirit will help to warn people of the dangers of hell. And the lake of fire. One of the functions of the Holy Spirit is to convict and to convince and to ultimately convert. How in the world 
can people claim to love God and serve God when they have no concern for lost people around them? If you allow the Holy Spirit in you to guide you, you won't be able to sit still. You have to go and warn people. You have to tell people about the eternal hell. You can be quiet. You must tell them the reality of their end. You have to warn them that they're, while they're in their sins that they're separated from God. And Acts 1 and 8, and says, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses in me, of me to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and other parts of the earth. There's a lake of fire and unbelievers. Those whose names are not in the Lamb's Book of Life will be cast into that lake. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, there will be a holy drive within you to point people to Christ so that they can be delivered of their sins and be made free. If your neighbor's house was on fire, would you just sit back and have a word of prayer for them? Would you just fold your hands and quietly say, Lord, wake them up before they lose everything and perish in these flames? No, not of course you would not. Out of the love for humanity and respect for life, you would go warn them and say, get out, get out. You're in danger of perishing and come to safely while you can. In the same way, we must warn people. We must alert them. We must get their attention. We must make them understand. We must convict them in the same way, out of respect for Christ who died for them and out of the love for lost people through the power of the Holy Spirit. The spirit-filled Christian must warn the lost and let them know that they are perishing. Thirdly, the power and purpose of the Holy Spirit is for witnessing. We again say, Acts 1 and 8, and you shall be witnesses of me. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can be a fearless, flaming witness for Christ instead of being a weak, scared of standing up for Christ. The Holy Spirit will take the chicken out of your life and you will be set free to be a bold ambassador. The power of the Holy Spirit will give you boldness, confidence, and courage to witness for Christ and to share your faith to others. The gift of the Holy Spirit is for for you. Jesus is God's special gift for the world, for the sinner, for God so loved the world that God gave his only begotten son. The Holy Spirit is God's special gift to the Christian. Jesus is God's special gift to the world, but Jesus gives to the Christian his Holy Spirit. Receiving Jesus will give you the power to be a child of God. Receiving the Holy Spirit will give you the power to serve Christ and to be an anointed, powerful witness. Let us not be satisfied with just words and a one-day celebration of Pentecost. Let us be what we were once called Pentecostal people who serve God in spirit and in truth. Many Christians are not experienced Pentecost for a number of reasons, but the greatest reason is because they are unaware of how rich and powerful it is and the difference that it will make in their lives. Pentecost will certainly bring us more of God's power to our daily lives. Pentecost will certainly take us to a higher place of worship. Pentecost will surely cause us to examine ourselves. Pentecost will change the way we think, talk, and act. Pentecost will give us a desire to live and walk in the Spirit. We'll be Spirit-led or guided by the Spirit of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. Whenever we experience Pentecost, there should be a significant spiritual impact on us, and this will cause us to tell others about what Jesus is doing in our lives. Many Christians are not experiencing Pentecost to its fullest extent. And some of us haven't even cracked the surface, but I think they do so because they don't have, they're unaware of how rich and powerful would make their lives. The Pentecost power of the Holy Spirit is greater than any evil in the world. And it is my prayer that from this message, each of you would desire to know and experience more of the Holy Spirit operating in your life and in your church. Let us no longer be satisfied with just words and a one-day celebration of Pentecost, but let us be what we were once called, Pentecostal people. 
we who serve God in spirit and in truth. This is that day that Joel spoke about, that in the last days that he pour out his spirit upon all flesh, that our sons and our daughters will prophesy. Our young men will see vision, our old men would dream dreams. It is my prayer that all of you would hunger and thirst of the more of God and the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Allow the Holy Spirit that dwells within you to transform you, to set you ablaze and send you forth through the hedges and highways and the byways and tell men and women everywhere to repent and come to Jesus. We are in a ripe season during this time of COVID where people are praying as never before. We are in the right place at the right time to tell men and women about Jesus. Their, their hearts are looking upward. Their hearts are reaching towards God. And the book of Acts says, and you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses of me. Let us be about our Father's business. Let us be about fulfilling the Great Commission. Let us walk in the Spirit, not just talk about the Spirit on Pentecost Sunday, but let us walk in the Spirit. Let us be guided by the Spirit. Let us be empowered by the Spirit. Let us be set ablaze by the Spirit. Let us worship the God that we know in Spirit and in truth. Let our church not just be a place of spectators but a place of participants who have gathered together to worship worship God with everything that they have this is what Pentecost Sunday is all about this is why we celebrate Pentecost Sunday every year that hopefully that it would stir our hearts that it would stir us up and it cause us to have a hunger and thirst after more God in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.